good morning and welcome to the lecture series narrative mode and fiction uh, i am dr sherbani banerji and this is our opening module module 1 it's called a study of genealogy we need to understand how genres happen what is a genre what is genealogy study of genres once we understand this we can then start discussing the different genres subgenres and the different modes we are going to discuss mostly the novel the modern and postmodern novel the short story within the scope of this lecture series so let's start understanding genre and its new classical formulation as a term genre indicates a formula and uh, it represents a conventional setting so genre represents a set of formal features thematic structures a situation of uh, address and rhetorical functions uh, genre mediates between social situation and the text so many scholars have uh, stated their critical views regarding genre and the study of genre which is genealogy for example john frow uh, notes that genre is a universal dimension of textuality further carlin uh, course campbell and kathleen hall jamison observe that a genre is uh, composed of constellation of recognizable forms that are bound together by an internal dynamic the dynamic is a fusion of uh, substantive stylistic and situational elements which work as a range of potential strategic responses to the demands of situation and the purposes of rhetoric caroline miller states that genres are typified rhetorical actions that are based on recurrent situations according to anthropologist bronislaw uh, malinowski genre is to quote malinowski a context of situation unquote an information laden structure that conveys a name purpose and direction of the accompanying activities further michael halliday states that genre is a semiotic structure and it is equivalent to linguistic register it is the configuration of semantic resources that the member of a culture typically associates with a situation uh, genre operates with an absolute dichotomy between concrete particular and the abstract general so john frow in his work genre identifies genre as a rigid trans historical class exercising control over the text that it generates and if friedman suggests that a text subscribes to a genre and corresponds through describing in terms of certain rules of a given genre charles beesman uh, suggests that as an extension of literary genres genre can be forms of life ways of being or existence they are frames for social action genres shape the thoughts we form and the communications by which we interact they are the familiar places we go to create intelligible communicative actions with each other and they are the guide posts that we use to explore the familiar now a deconstructionist uh, such as jacques derrida notes that the genre draws the signs of limitation and the limits establish the norms and interdictions within which a text can operate so derrida in his work the law of genre states i quote a text would not belong to any genre every text participates in one or several genres there is no genreless text there is always a genre and genres uh, yet 
such participation never amounts to belonging unquote. So, a text is more or less than a genre, but not quite one particular genre that is where Derrida is coming from. Genres are differentiated into simple and complex genres by Jean Frau on the basis of situations that are dealt with in them. It was Mikhail Bakhtin who further differentiated genres into primary and secondary genres. Primary genres comprise uh, artistic, scientific and socio-political texts, whereas secondary genres also known as complex genres or uh, speech genres comprise novels, dramas and all kinds of scientific research. During the process of their formation, the secondary genres absorb and digest uh, various primary genres. The primary genres uh, transform themselves before entering into secondary texts. They lose their immediate relation to actual reality and they uh, forego some of their real utterances. Generic complexity happens when the simple genres mix with complex genres. The primary genre is univocal because it speaks its own language. On the other hand, complex genres are usually multivocal. So, intertextuality comes into play through a range of processes through which a text invokes the other and also through their relationships with other texts. Critics like Charles Briggs and Richard Bauman would note that genre is quintessentially intertextual. When any discourse is linked to a particular genre, the process by which it is uh, produced and received is mediated through its relationship with a prior discourse. The link of a given genre is, however, not made to uh, isolated utterances. The link uh, is uh, made to uh, generalized or abstracted models of discourse production and reception. So, the neoclassical accounts of the literary genres prevail in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries in full swing. According to Socrates, everything that is said by poets and storytellers is a, to quote him, a narration or digestus of past, present or future things, unquote. And it proceeds to quote again either by pure narration or by a narrative that is effected through imitation or by both, unquote. David uh, Fishlow states that literary genres were divided on the basis of four sets of analogies uh, that are conceptualized by 20th century critics, namely biological species, family, social situations and speech acts. Further, Thomas Beebe speaks of four stages of genre criticism since the Renaissance in which genre is understood successively as rules, as organically developing species, as patterns of textual features and as conventions of reading. Classical writers tended to emphasize meter as a determining factor for genres. Accepting as at least one determinant, most modern critics in England and America would call a form such as the sonnet as a genre. On the other hand, other theorists uh, preferring to exclude metrical patterns from their uh, consideration of genre would like to place a type such as the sonnet into a separate category which is termed as fixed form. Tizidwit and Todorov maintains that genre is not a subject matter per se but rather the state of mind that it induces. The history of the epic exemplifies the force of generic conventions. According to Homer, an epic is generally a long heroic poem divided 
into units that are labeled cantos or books. Its diction is elevated, its action sweeping in scope and more specific conventions uh, are there which include uh, the invocation of the god or gods uh, who will preside over the journey or the venture. There are also mention of, there are also uh, epithets that are associated with the heroes. All of these qualities uh, inform the primary epic the way uh, Homer envisions it, the Homeric uh, primary epic. So, the second type of genre that we have after epic is novel. The novel serves the novelist's interest in the uh, literature of the past and however uh, lends a fresh perspective to the new literary form. It is a breakaway from epic. So, the treatment of time and characters are very different in the novel as the name itself suggests. Novel means something new. In literature, the basis of resemblance uh, lies in literary tradition. So, tradition produces generic resemblance, a sequence of influence and imitation uh, and inherited codes that connect works that belong to a single genre. Uh, poems are made from older poems. To use Keats metaphor, each is the child of an earlier uh, representative of the genre and may yet be the mother of a subsequent representative. Right? Aristotle's tragedy is constituted uh, by realizations of certain elements. These are story or mythos, character or ethe, dialogue or lexis, characters, thought or dianoia, spectacle or opsis and the lyrical element also called melopoeia. So, the genre is identified not only by the presence of episodia and stasima uh, of certain metrical patterns and certain devices for example, stichomythia, but also by a serious plot with reversals and discoveries a noble protagonist and emotions of high intensity uh, occasioned by a conflict of values. Apart from the historical kinds, the broad term genre also includes the more or less unstructured modes on the one hand and purely formal constructions or constructional types on the other. These categories can be distinguished through appealing to the idea of generic repertoire. In subgenres, we find a set of obligatory part repertoire comprising, sub, uh, comprising substantive rules that pertain to external characteristics together with some additional specifications of content. So, in a subgenre, some of the qualities, some of the aspects uh, refer back to the genre from which it has originated and yet there are certain external additional characteristics that are uh, specific to this subgenre, specific to the content. Compared with historical genre, the subgenre category adds features whereas the mode subtracts them. So, amority for example is uh, amority in mode. Elizabethan sonnet in kind and of the blazon subgenre. Generic features have distinctive uh, representational aspects such as being narrative, being dramatic, lyrical or discursive. Every kind is characterized by an external structure. For example, Attic tragedy has manifestly some such uh, structure as prologue or choral song or episode or uh, you know exode uh, where, where neoclassical tragedy has a 
five act structure. So, renaissance uh, so renaissance brief epics and biblical epics are commonly divided into four or six or seven books whereas in classical uh, primary epics especially uh, we see uh, divisions into 12 or 24 books either in accordance with ancient uh, precedents or uh, you know in terms of number symbolisms uh, so the hexameric 6 for example the inside the encyclopedic 24 for example. In earlier literature numerological structure regularly contributed to uh, generic differentiation. So, based on how many uh, books a work has or how many cantos an epic has would account for the uh, generic differentiation the genre it belongs to. So, uh, triumphal poems usually had symmetrical structures with a central emphasis epithalmia were divided by temporal or nuptial numbers. In ancient criticism metrical structure was especially genre linked indeed uh, meters were so rigorously connected with particular kinds as to provide a basis of classification. For example, Aristotle writes of iambics as formerly used for invective but extended to comedy. Some critics have also understood the form as promptly becoming uh, neutralized and abdicating its role as a generic label. Meter had subsequently become more closely genre linked than in the former times. So, for example, uh, common meter is mainly associated with the Christian hymn, whereas uh, the ancient hymn lacked any metrical form altogether, right. So, as every kind has a formal structure, so it must have a size too. Indeed, size counts as a critical factor from a generic point of view. Closely related to size is scale. Scale when combined with other features um, may serve as a sensitive generic indicator. Picaresque's frequent changes of setting establish a scale that is specific to its type and rules out characterizes and, and rules out char characteristics of other kinds of narrative, something that is unique to the picaresque. Similarly, values are inherent in all kinds. There have been among the themes of, so these have been among the themes of several important studies such as uh, Rosenmeier's uh, Green Cabinet which focuses on the Epicurean values in certain pastoral kinds. Satire may seem chaotic or nihilistic, but in reality it is more often traditional if not uh, conservative. Its positive values are implicit and uh, offered with elaborate uh, obliquity, surprise and even a sudden denouement or climax, all of which entail uh, familiarity in order to communicate themselves. A distinctive value of satire is its strangely secure candor. Uh, it is uh, confident, uh, you know, so it is confident of the fact that truth is exposed rather than colored or made bearable. That is where confidence or, or the candor of satire comes from. Each kind has an emotional coloration which may be called the mood almost in the sense that Milton uses. To quote Milton, the strain I heard was of a higher mood, unquote, where he raises Lycidas in generic pitch. Mood plays a specifically vital part in 
gothic romance where it often uh, colors certain characters, atmosphere and the natural description. In their starting point, many kinds used to have a characteristic occasion. In these occasional kinds, for example, epithalmian, uh, episod, genetliacum, relations with rituals and customs were particularly intimate and rich. Occasion in its imaginary attenuated form coalesces with the stylistic features as is observable in the short poetic kinds. Lyrical forms often seem to imply actual interpersonal relations. So, for example, uh, John Donne's A Valediction Forbidding Morning adopts a similarly intimate stance. Narrative kinds may have a distinctive misocene. This is a highly developed feature in romance, uh, science fiction, the gothic short story and the psychological novel with certain types of very similar novel. However, uh, the setting may become uh, insignificant. Character is also a very important focus, one of the chief focuses of genre theory. This usually involves much fine drawn moral analysis since a character personifies certain values. In epic, the generic protagonist has gone through a long course of development but has always had a strategic uh, moral significance. Uh, as an example, we have uh, Spencer, we have Spencer relating his Arthur to previous examples of a good governor and a virtuous man. Similarly, uh, Milton trains his readers to recognize his Satan as a hero with pagan epic values. Aristotle says that the tragic protagonist should be, to quote him, a man preeminently virtuous and just, unquote, whose misfortunes are brought on, to quote him again, not by vice and depravity but by some error of judgment." Unquote. I would like to stop this lecture here today and let us meet for further lectures and for further discussions. Thank you.